You guys, aren't they beautiful? My beautiful bride is here. And then beautiful Rachel over there and these knuckle draggers right here. <laughs> so uh, we're, just, we're just so happy uh, for people that are watching this live for joining us here on our deep adventure retreat. And it's your fault that you're not here with us. So next year, hopefully you'll join us for our deep adventure retreat on the virtues. So it's okay, baby. It's funny. It's funny. So, um, you guys wonder what heaven's really going to be like? Get up here, guys. Get up here. Get up here. You tell them what heaven's going to be like. First you. What's heaven going to be like? I feel like it's going to be like endless party whenever a sinner confesses. And Amen. Amen. Uh, Amen. And when you wish and you think of something, it would just appear. <laughs> like you think I would disappear? <laughs> okay. <laughs> what do you think heaven's going to be like? An uh, endless boat party. <laughs> <laughs> and would you say something about marshmallows or is that Thomas? Thomas. Okay, well you okay. tell us. Endless Get over, marshmallows. Come over here and tell us about your ride. Endless marshmallows on a roller coaster that you just fly and then you get marshmallows out of here. <laughs> you the ride, you, you hit a big marshmallow? Mm -hmm. Well, that's what the clouds are. Big yeah. <laughs> do you, will you get to see dinosaurs, yeah. maybe, do you think, or no? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, what kind? I'm probably all uh, of them. I don't know. See, that's when that's all right. Can you want me to get up there? Can you want me to get up there? I'm going to have fun if I can add my very own creature. Oh, there you go. Yeah, awesome. And you can ride? Okay, so who knows? We don't know what how, how the heaven might be. I'm going to imagine the Illuminati. <laughs> what well, is that? Oh, that is. Okay. Is that is nothing. Okay. You know that. He's not even a dollar bill. But you said other words too. You said other big words like a hypno ride. What's that? It's a hip. It's a ride. That hypnotizes you at the end and hey. you the chicken. Hey, it's this, this guy's telling us about it. You said there's chickens at the end of it? No. What? He never interrupted me. Yeah, you tell us. You tell us. So you would be riding in this hypno ring and, and uh, it would go like, well, so fast it looks like you're going slow. Mm -hmm. No, it only appears oh. like that to other people. Yeah, that likes hyperspace. Physics. Okay, <laughs> all you guys go back over there now. And, uh, what, what, what else? And, uh, at the end, there will be this big hypno ring, and then this big deep voice, which uh, says, which is, uh, well, a radio that says, do the chicken dance. And, and then you do the chicken dance. <laughs> yeah, at the end when Sounds like off. a blast. Okay, all you guys, thank you guys so much. Yeah, it's like heaven's gonna be awesome. Yeah, one of my big questions about heaven is is there ever, you know, one of the great things we love is you're dropping in a big wave. One of the things we like is we gotta have our wits about so we might die. Well, what kind of challenges will we have in, in heaven? You know, maybe Joe and I are gonna have to go over and help a new planet get started or something. Who knows? But we're gonna have great work to do and beautiful and the gifts that God's given us. Uh, Sydney's going to be a great country western city. <laughs> I just know. Uh, can I talk a moment about hope? It's a beautiful day for me today because um, the scriptures are of the eagle, my mom and dad's favorite scripture. When you, when my dad was a assistant to superintendent of schools, and then he became a professional speaker, and then a, a deacon and a great homilist. But you know, in the diaconate, the woman and the husband really are a team, and so they would host. Um, what they called Eagle's Rest Retreats. They built a home on the north shore of a lake in the north woods of Minnesota. My mom was there, there so they kind of ended up moving back there. And um, they would invite mostly president of companies to come. Because uh, those people who are presidents of small companies tend to be lonely. They're kind of alone at the top. And so he'd call the Eagles together. And it was called, where they lived was called Eagle's Rest. And the only way you could find their home was to follow these backwoods there was no garment, right, or anything like that. And there would be an eagle soaring this way or an eagle soaring that way. And that's how you would come to their home. And finally, you would come to their, their dirt road that went into their home. And there would be a sign that said, had that quote. You know, uh, he renews my strength like an eagle's. And, um, and it meant so much. I guess we're going to ask the boys to be a little bit more quiet. We love them. You know, there's a lot of kids in heaven, you know. So, um... So my parents love that. And my dad, when he uh, 
who received his diaconate ordination, the song that they sang was Is Israel Kahanavika Ole sings this song, you know, to um, Wind Beneath My Wings. I forget who was the original the voice of that. And my mother always was with my father, and he would always get all the attention, but she was really the strength there, you know, in prayer and supporting what he was doing publicly. And so this song meant so much to them. And I remember uh, my mother, I told you how about 20 years before she died, she had this word from the Lord, write down these about 14 page little booklet to give to the, to the children uh, uh, what God wanted to say. And then she had a stroke and then she couldn't speak anymore. She said kind of like, she could say because of all the people. Interestingly, she could sing in tongues for a while. And that kind of diminished too. But my mother and father had a great love affair. They just loved each other so much. Uh, and my mother then, uh, her health, she had a, a very rare disease that diminished her over the years, and we lost my mom about eight years ago. But um, when, when, I, when I got the call come to come to Minnesota, they were on vacation in Minnesota. My mother had some challenges, and they were just kind of stuck there. So I got a call, come to Minnesota. Um, your mom is, is dying. So I got on the plane. I brought tons of Hawaiian lace, plumeria, tuberose, um, beautiful fragrances of Hawaii that she loved so much. They lived there for so many years. And uh, laid them all over her bed. And, uh, and I remember coming in in the morning, uh, everyone had kind of left her alone for a while. It was just before sunrise. And I walked in, and I could see the sun was about to rise. So I opened up the curtains of her room, overlooking this frozen river, the Mississippi River in St. Cloud, Minnesota. And my, uh, my uh, family then all of a sudden kind of all gathered, you know, how <coughs> lost and everybody is. We'd all been staying up in the, in the, in the, ho the hospital overnight. And um, I opened up the curtain, and suddenly an eagle flew in over the, over the a bald eagle. They had bald eagles on their, on their lake, too. A bald eagle flew in right towards her room, eye level, but just like this. And it did. It flew, and everyone looked all the and it came right close to the window and did a figure eight, figure eight, and then flew away. And at that moment, my mother's breath began to change, you know, that shallow breath. And within a minute and a half or two, then she was gone. But she hadn't spoken, you know, for uh, 20 years of complete sex. It's very hard. And she'd been in a coma for, I think, 10 days. So yeah, she hadn't been speaking. At that moment of her death, she we heard her say this, oh, 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 the beatific vision, the hope. I like when I just like that. And you know, I gotta tell you, I've never cried for my mother this past. I just had such, I don't mean to suppress the tears. I just had such great joy for her. And it was from that moment that my ministry exploded. And my mom went to heaven and began to pray. And now my dad, uh, who's had a change in his season of his life is approaching that time too. And so just, just rem and here's the thing. My father was a six foot four powerful man. Now he's child. Um, and he, what he does is he loves the children. He doesn't hardly get to go to mass anymore, but we'd go to mass and he would give out holy cards to all the children. Oh God, I love you, you're special. No one else like you in the whole world. You're so beautiful. Um, and it reminded me, remember, of, of, of John, St. John, uh, you know, uh, the Apostle John. He lived longer than all the other apostles, and he was the only one that wasn't martyred. Yeah. But he said, in his later years, he would just say, children love one another. My, do my dad's become nothing but love, right, Cindy? Mm -hmm. No smart things to say anymore. Childlike things to say. Love one another. And that's what that's what this is all about. It's just hope. Hope. Such a brief time here on earth. And then, to see God face to set, face to see all of them. So to me, that's, the, that's, what, that's what I would share if I was in a group on the, on the virtue of the But now we're going to talk about justice. We're going to be talking about, ju we're talking about the virtue of justice. Um, uh, by the way, I've been to the island of Patmos with Joe and Fran and Jeanette. Which the, great, the, great, the great rock. Uh, cave where he was, and when God spoke, there's three. Uh, it's, but it's, there's three um, splits in that rock. When the voice, well, God, the voice of God spoke, the Trinity. Talk about the virtue of justice. What's so just about the cross? 
It's scandalous. It's scandalous that the Son of God would be crucified and die on the cross. When we talk about justice, we're going to talk, let's talk about it from the point of view of the cross. Uh, what we see when we see Jesus on the cross, the world sees. What did Jesus see when he was on the cross? The, the Catholic message of salvation is, is different than what Martin Luther proposed. Uh, the, the, the Protestant, for the most part, although there's so many different versions of that, is a concept called penal substitution. That God sent Jesus into the world for basically one reason, and that's to die. And the death on the cross uh, was to, um, I, I'm so distracted, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I, keep I don't know what to do. Yeah. Thank you. These beautiful children, but I'm happy to discuss. Sherry, so you're earlier it, it's when a, you said, um, yeah. there's a lot of kids in heaven. She said, is that a threat? <laughs> <laughs> that's cute. So, uh, that's cute. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, when, when, when Martin Luther, who was kind of a, had a very, I think, psychological challenges, you know, and one of the things he said was that the blood of the priests and nuns should run in the street, so I kind of think twice about his, his theology, but he had this concept of penal substitution, that God sent Jesus to the world for one reason, and that is to go to the cross to be what? To be punished for our sins, to take the place of us so God the Father could punish him, and that God the Father could turn his head and, let, and, and for a moment of time, be separated from his son and let his son experience the punishment for our sin. That's twisted to me in my mind. That's very sick to me, to think that God the Father would, would do that. What is the Catholic teaching on soteriology, as we say, in salvation? The Catholic teaching is that Jesus came into the world to uh, become human like us in every way except for sin. But in that cosmic way, he lived it. All of us. He became. He, he reaches out to all of us, and he said, "I said this the other day." He said, "I came to fulfill all righteousness." And so, by doing that, he redeemed our dignity. He restored our dignity. When you see Jesus on the cross, do you think God the Father, who is love, said, "I'm punishing my son for your sins," or did he not feel the ache that any father here would have? Wouldn't it be easier? For you to die on than to have one of your children die. Jesus had this wonderful, beautiful sacrifice on the cross. I think God the Father suffered more. He suffered more. He sent his only son to become one with us. And he loved his son. When Jesus cried out on the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was quoting a psalm. If you read the whole psalm, you see that he comes back to a point of trusting that. In God, and he was crying out in his humanness, in his divinity, he could never be separated from his Father, right? For God is not, um, God is uh, one, Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons with one nature. Jesus is is uh, the third, the second person of the Trinity, but he has two natures, all God, all man. Did he used to have, did he used to be all God and all man, or is he still? He is still forever. That's how much <coughs> dignity everyone on earth is of incomparable worth. How do I know that? Because the incomparable God became man. And why? To fulfill all righteousness. Every righteous act of Jesus was a decision of his human will. He had two wills. Because he was all God and all man. He chose again and again to fulfill all righteousness. It wasn't easy. He was tempted by, by Lucifer himself. On the cross, he could have he could have come off the cross if he chose to. And why did he go to the cross? I just think of it as a weight lifter, just <sighs> all of mankind. And of course, because he was cosmically in that sense, all of, you know, he joined himself with humanity throughout all time and space at that moment on the cross. And then he did this, <clears throat> and he restored our dignity, so we can. Scandal of the cross. Is that justice? That's mercy. Is that God punishing Jesus? That's Jesus showing mercy. How beautiful our Catholic faith is. What a different concept, right? God loved us so much that He sent His only Son. Whoever believed Him would have eternal life.
you want to know what it is in Hawaii? For God so aloha the world that he sent his one and only boy that whoever loved God would have life to the max. That's pigeon. <laughs> it's actually a, that's actually a pigeon translation. I have a New Testament pigeon, Hawaiian pigeon. <laughs> so then now let's talk about what justice is. Justice is, the catechism teaches us, is to give to each person what they have due from us. Is God a person? What does he have due from us? What do we owe God? Everything. 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 He gave us everything. It cost him a lot. I can't imagine being God the Father and seeing his eternally begotten son suffer like that. It reminds me of a, a story of a, a man who loved, who was the man who changed the rails on a train. When two trains would come in, they would go separate ways. And he went out to, uh, to do this, and uh, he, his young son followed him. He didn't know it. He was in the middle of the night. And his son got stuck in a train in, in between the two train guards, and two trains were coming. And the father had to make a decision, save his son or save the hundreds of people in the train. And he pulled that switch to save the other people in the train. And a great sacrifice of his son was not even acknowledged by the hundreds of people that were saved. And that's the world today. There's been a great gift, and it's not acknowledged. And so we have to give all of our passions, all of our appetites, all of our yearnings, all of our dreams, everything, just give it to us, just give it to the Lord. And because in the virtue of justice, there's two parts to it. There's the justice due to each other, and there's the justice due to God. People say, where is the virtue of humility in the seven virtues? It's right there. It, it, there's a scripture verse that says in Micah, to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with our God. The virtue in its classic sense has two focuses, justice towards God and justice towards others. So you think of justice towards God as the vertical beam of the cross and justice towards others here. But I contemplate that intersection of one of the greatest gifts you can give to God is to give him uh, yourself to, in the sense of, a sense of justice towards yourself too. You owe it to yourself to seek out God's salvation, to be on that great quest. You know, to the adventure of our own pedagogy, our own journey towards the Lord. You need to be just towards yourself. And what a great gift that is to give to God, is to say yes to giving yourself salvation. It's not something that happens to you. It's something that you open yourself to. God is always knocking, always knocking. It's still a small boy, the deepest part of your heart. You know, we have our passion, but there's a deeper yearning, you know, how you love uh, Swit, um, Switzer, and he talks about the catechism talks about the upper yearnings of a man's soul for justice, for truth, for love, for beauty, uh, and for a sense of going home. There's a desire in us that's greater than any agenda that we might have, and that's that would be justice to God to give God everything. So in that center, be think about yourself. Giving yourself to the Lord is the greatest justice you can give to God. <laughs> Jesus said that we, we he, he, that he came that we might have life and have it to the max, have it abundantly. John 10, 10. I have a friend of mine, you probably know who uh, Aaron Rodgers is. His brother uh, is, uh, is on a reality, was on a reality TV show that I, a concept I created and they called it Clean Break. And he had tattooed right here his brother Luke uh, John 10, 10, the scripture John 10. You know how painful that would be to have how painful it was when you when you see Jesus, uh, the the kind of statue that they they had, they they did a life size statue of him based on the shroud you saw in Jerusalem at the, at the hotel there, and you see the piercing. But he pours out his life that we might have life to the max, that we might have abundant and eternal life. A strong sense of justice stabilizes us and gives, our, gives us balance in our dealings with God and man. So 
when you drop into a big wave, you transition from lying on your board to getting to your feet. Your feet may have to shift a bit as you find that perfect balance point and then you lean into the wave. One of the most beautiful things you can do is trace the face of a wave as you're riding it. And it also slows you down so the wave can come over you. And the more the wave comes over you, the more you lean in. That's a beautiful uh, expression of, of leaning into God, touching the face of God, and he hidden in Christ there inside, inside the two. Often reaching into the face of the wave draws you closer to it. I remember once dropping a wire man and it dislocated my finger in a 24 foot wave. Often reaching into the face of the wave draws you closer to it and helps you to change your trajectory. Justice is exactly that. It is getting to your feet and finding that solid sense of the balance point by reaching out and touching the face of God in the give and take between ourselves and God and ourselves and others. Finding this solid, stabilizing balance point of justice provides us with the stance and disposition we need to draw a clean line on the wave of life as we pursue the other virtues. One of the most profound ways that you can help balance the scales of justice, could we know, everybody in this room is extremely blessed in terms of freedom, in terms of uh, provision. What's the great way that we can balance that in equity in the world? Intercessory prayer. Of course, giving to but intercessory prayer. So to give uh, ourselves to a life of prayer. I love it when you pray the rosary. How many here have, have done their devotion to Jesus through Mary? Uh, so there's a so what there's a book that I read. I think it's called 33 Days. days, days, days the yeah, it, it, it simplifies the process. And I did it in Puerto Rico on the cruise with my day. But when you, when you pray the rosary, it's really beautiful because you say, Mary, give this to whoever um, whoever uh, uh, needs, it. needs it the most. And I know when I pray in tongues, often I go into a very deep time of groaning. I don't know who I pray but God does. So one of the greatest things you can do in life is intercessory prayer to help balance the injustice that uh, you know is in other places around the world. Give your prayers the rosary or tongues or however you pray, Lord, let my prayers be, you know, a gift to, uh, to lift up the injustice around the world. Justice is not virtue signal. Social justice warriors are, want us all to be very, very accepting, what do they call that? What's the word that's used? Um, I'll just leave it at that, just to be very accepting of everything. Tolerant. But they're, huh? Tolerant. Tolerant. But they're not tolerant of Christians. They, they don't like Christians too much because we say there is absolute, there is absolute uh, uh, moral teaching. So, uh, but what we, we what, what justice is, if you say that you're pro-life, that's just an opinion. If you give money to the local crisis pregnancy center where you stand and you pray, you know, I interviewed a woman <coughs> in uh, Cleveland, Ohio at the big um, fest, fest at the big Christmas. Christian festival. I think it's a Catholic festival, actually. And she said, I, I, she saw me and I said, I just, I don't know how the conversation began, but she told me uh, that she had had an abortion. I don't even think the young man that was with her knew it. She said, I've only told one other person. And I asked her this question. So many people judged her because she had an abortion. We judge her. And so wrong because I asked her, if there had been a man, a boyfriend, an uncle, your dad, who would have stood with you, that you could have shared that with, and not be afraid to share that with, who would have stood with you, would have you had the abortion? No. The reality is 95% of the women who suffer an abortion do that because men don't step up. And all these men, the judge would judge you. Well, look at yourself. If you're pro-life, what are you doing? Are you helping a crisis pregnancy? And if you let your, your children know you or a friend somehow has uh, has, a, has a pregnancy that you don't, didn't want, let them know that we're here to help them personally. We will help um, uh, adopt or just help you financially or be with you through that process. So the reason why there's so much abortion in the world in America is because of men who are taking advantage of women and who won't step up. Stop blaming the women. Don't judge them so harshly. They're victims too. 
Not to say they don't have their part in it, but <coughs> that's what justice is. Right? Social warrior has an opinion. A real person of justice does something about it. So we're going to uh, take a moment, I guess, to, to break out to our groups, but I want the men in the back and the women together. And uh, I want the men to get real about this subject, about justice. What are you, what are you, what are you doing about uh, not just talking about it, but doing something about it? And we'll get the women together over here. Women can be here, I think. Is that, where did yep. you? Yeah, get over there. The pattern yeah. over there. Okay. <laughs> and, um, do you want, Sherry, do you want to read the women's group this time? <coughs> Yeah. Yeah. Anybody needs to go. Of course, you don't have to. You don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> Too much information. Yeah. And uh, let's see. Dave, you want to leave the, leave the group again back there? Yes. Yeah, we'll yeah. Thank you for joining us on this part of uh, our retreat. We'll be coming to you again tomorrow with two more of the virtues. Aloha.